ég vil kynna fyrir ykkur herra Mark Crispin Miller hann er sem starfaðið prófessor við New York háskóla NYU og ef hann er kannski best hægtur fyrir skrif sínum áróður það sem fangaði aðtökli mína varandi hann var að þegar ég tók eftir með að skrifa yngangin í þessa bók hérna Propaganda sem kom fyrst út árið 1928 og höfundur hennar er Edward Bernays eða sem er sérstætt að Edward Bernays er að hann er náfrændi Freuds og í þá dag þá tilgaðast það að bönnir tölu ekki um matarborðið þannig að hugmyndirna sem að voru á sveimum það matarborð fjöldur undinlegðu og þannig hefur hann kannski öðlast þannig grundvalla skilningin í þá sálfræði sem hún þarf að hafa til að fara og fjalla og nota áróður þannig að myrki Ég vil bara þá bara að bjóða herra Mark Crispin Miller velkomin og býð ykkur að taka vel á mótanum, gerið þið svo vel Thank you, Gunnar. I want to thank Gunnar Kjeld, who was the one who um, thought to bring me here and, and managed to do so, and to scare up a crowd big enough to fill this room, which is very gratifying to someone who teaches propaganda, uh, not how to do it, but how to study it, and who's not allowed to teach it any longer uh, at NYU, which is a story I could tell if, if you're interested. What I want to do is um, very, very briefly give you uh, a sense of my uh, story, because that story of my own will help shed light on what propaganda is, okay? Uh, so it's pertinent to note that I began as an English professor back in the 70s. I got my doctorate at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and my field was the English Renaissance. So I, I studied and wrote about Shakespeare. I taught Shakespeare courses. I also taught uh, film courses. And as I um, studied film uh, ever more carefully, I came to notice that a lot of the visual subtleties in cinema were also um, uh, evident in, in advertising and in propaganda generally so that if one were to study works of propaganda as, as closely and carefully and critically as one studies film or literature, one can often discover, you know, not great depths, not great beauty, as, as is the case with art that you study carefully, but it does help to um, improve one's understanding of what propaganda is all about, how a given propaganda drive is meant to affect us, um, then we begin to study the question of how to tell the truth claims of propaganda from lies. We then think to look uh, and find out who is behind a, a given propaganda drive, what its ultimate goal is, and so on. So, that's as much of the story as I need to tell you before I move on to explain what happened to my own career, um, you'll see that it's, it's very instructive. I was always on the left. I always identified as being on the left from the time I was in college. I wrote for the left media in uh, the United States, and I was regarded by the um, press establishment as a rather edgy character, I was a little bit out there, but I was still um, permissible in polite society. In other words, I was regarded as maybe a little extreme, but worth hearing from. So with that reputation, I wrote a number of um, opinion pieces for the New York Times. I was often on national public radio. Uh, sometimes I was on public TV. Uh, what happened then? Well, uh, I wrote a few books about uh, the Bush regime, you know, Bush-Cheney. I'd written a book called Boxed In, The Culture of TV, which is a collection of essays on different aspects of mass culture. In the early millennium, I was 
increasingly troubled by ever-growing evidence that the election system in the United States is completely corrupt and that those who win our elections didn't necessarily win them. Then I was staggered to see how much evidence of theft there was in the 2004 election in the United States. That's the election that ostensibly re-elected Bush Cheney, although they weren't elected in the first place, okay, in 2000, that was stolen. And there was a great deal of evidence that the 2004 election was stolen as well. Well, I was very upset about this as a believer in democracy, and this is my country after all. So I wrote a book about it called Fooled Again, uh, The Real Case for Election Reform. It was very thoroughly sourced. It was published by a major publisher. We were all very excited about its coming out because we thought it would finally jumpstart a much needed national discussion of the urgent need for radical reform of the voting system. Because the publisher thought that, I thought that, I hired a publicist, she thought that, so we were all in agreement. Well, the book was blacked out by the corporate media, much to my surprise and unhappiness. <coughs> uh, there were two newspaper reviews in the entire United States of America. One was um, an attack piece. And NPR, National Public Radio, which had often had me on, as I said, refused to, to interview me on the subject of the book. This was very strange. But it was not as strange as what happened in the left press. While the corporate media blacked the book out, the left press, and remember, I had written for the left press for years, the left press called me a conspiracy theorist and said that my book was conspiracy theory. This was a big surprise to me, and, and it was mystifying, and it prompted me to wonder where that came from. Where did that phrase come from? I know it's used in Iceland. It's used all over the world now. So how did that happen? So once I got my bearings, and I got a shock of having been dismissed this way, I set about to study the origins of that phrase, right? I asked myself, did the press in this country always uh, attack people for conspiracy theory? And is this a phrase that has always sprung to the lips of Americans so easily? So I decided I would do, you know, a bit of research, all it really required was um, doing a search in the archives of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Time Magazine on the phrase conspiracy theory and the phrase conspiracy theorist. <clears throat> and what I found was that prior to 1967, the phrase conspiracy theory was only used now and then by journalists and in no consistent way. <clears throat> the phrase conspiracy theorist had never been used by any journalist. All of a sudden, in 1967, both phrases are used ever more frequently. And going forward from 1967, over the years, over the decades, the phrase, its use multiplied exponentially. So now it's, you know, if you do a search on it now, you'll never come to the end of the results. Right? So, why did this happen? Well, some further research revealed that it, it started in 1967 because it was early in that year that the CIA uh, sent a memo to all station chiefs worldwide urging them, each station chief in every country, including Iceland, no doubt, to uh, use their friends in the media and their various other cultural assets to attack the writings of a, a certain few authors who had been raising critical questions about the Kennedy assassination. This memo, and the number of the memo is 
960. You can find it online, right? The memo explains at the very beginning, our problem is these books that have come out, raising questions about the Warren Report, which is the official explanation of Kennedy's murder. You know, Lee Harvey Oswald <coughs> killed Kennedy, that story. These writers were raising questions that were prompting people, reasonably enough, to question that narrative. So they basically jump-started a smear campaign which was meant to uh, not to engage the arguments raised by those authors. On the contrary, the purpose of the propaganda was to make sure nobody would pay attention to their arguments. Because if you're a conspiracy theorist, you are a crank, you are a nut. See? You're out of your mind. And uh, if anything, you deserve pity. Uh, maybe you deserve, uh, you know, uh, uh, chuckles of ridicule. So that's what happened. That propaganda effort, whose purpose was simply to abort this um, critical re-examination of the Warren Report narrative, it took, it kept, it didn't just go away then, but it continued to be used. Conspiracy theory continued to be used against people raising questions about Bobby Kennedy's assassination, people raising questions about Martin Luther King's assassination, jumping ahead in time, people raising questions about 9-11, right? People raising questions about any official narrative, right? That would prompt accusations of conspiracy theory uh, from the media, from the government, and so on, see? So, that's a very important piece of information. And let me recommend a book, if you're interested in the subject. It's called Conspiracy Theory in America. It's written by uh, a social scientist named Lance DeHaven Smith. Lance wrote the book at my request for a series I was editing for the University of Texas Press. And the book tells the whole story of how the memo was formulated, why it was formulated, and most importantly, its devastating civic and political consequences. Okay? Let me say very briefly, historically, the American people were never reluctant to question elite intentions. I mean, our Declaration of Independence is a conspiracy theory because it accuses George III of doing all these things, some of which he did and some of which he didn't do. And if it were published today, it would be attacked as conspiracy theory. Uh, but going forward from the Revolution through the 19th century into the 20th century, Americans were always unashamed, unafraid, to raise suspicious questions about the elites. But this propaganda drive has changed that. It has made people distrustful of their own suspicions, which is really very dangerous. Because democracy, to some extent, to a significant extent, depends on those suspicions. There's nothing unreasonable about, about them. Okay? Now, propaganda, what is it? I have a very, very simple definition for you. It's any organized attempt to move large numbers of people to some thought or action. Right? It's a plain, unadorned definition. Or to move them away from a certain thought or action. Okay? That's propaganda. But it's much more than that. It is explosive to study it critically and impartially. And to demonstrate this to you, I'm going to ask you to watch a video of a panel uh, that I was on in, in 2017. Uh, it was um, about the um, U.S. involvement in Syria and the news about Syria and all the atrocity stories about the Syrian government you know, gassing their own people and stuff like that. It's about 10, 15 minutes. I think you'll find it very interesting, and then I'll resume uh, after it's over. Okay? Thank you. Um, yeah, 
even, even though we're focusing on Syria today uh, at the present moment, that is 2017, I, I thought it would be appropriate to begin by harking back to 1917, 100 years ago, uh, to take note of the uh, catastrophic success of the Allied propaganda drive that brought the United States into World War I, which was actually a very uh, direct echo of the British propaganda drive from two years earlier that uh, impelled the British people to support uh, joining the drive to defeat the Hun and save poor little Belgium from its ongoing rape by that uh, brutal entity. Uh, the British and then the Americans were uh, bowled over by these reports of the Germans uh, impaling babies on bayonets, cutting the breasts off of Red Cross nurses. Uh, there was the story of the crucified Canadian, a Canadian soldier who'd actually been crucified by the, by the Germans. This was uh, the first time that a state had ever used the resources of mass suasion, of propaganda, to get an entire population to support uh, a war that they ordinarily wouldn't have supported ever uh, because the cause was an obscure one. It was really just a kind of imperial scramble. Different imperial powers were fighting with each other over Africa and places like that. But it was represented as a fight to um, make the world safe for democracy, to save civilization itself from the brutal Germans, and as I say, it can't be stressed strongly enough or repeatedly enough that it was a rousing success. During the war, a few journalists, a few American journalists actually made an effort to go over to Europe and follow the German army around and report on what they were actually doing. And they found, it's important to note, they found the German army was indeed uh, brutal they functioned with brutal efficiency. So they didn't go over there and find that they were a bunch of hippies <laughs> handing out flowers, but they also found no evidence whatsoever to support any of those particular atrocity claims that were used so effectively. All right, so three journalists were basically spitting into the wind, reported to their respective papers that this was all wildly exaggerated. It didn't make any difference. It wasn't until 10 years later when uh, a member of parliament named Arthur Ponsonby wrote a book called Lies in Wartime in which he carefully, meticulously cataloged each of these notorious claims and found that they had all been made up. And he explained how it had been done. He explained what the purpose of each propaganda drive was. And this had a huge effect on public opinion both in Britain and in the United States. And people realized briefly that propaganda uh, was um, actually an extremely effective and very dangerous force. All right, now I want to jump ahead. Arthur Ponsonby, P-O-N-S-O-N-B-Y. Now this is, um, I'm going to jump ahead very briefly before I get to today uh, to a kind of midpoint moment uh, this is when some of the most avid students of the British propaganda, that is uh, Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler, had, and I'm not being facetious, uh, Hitler says in Mein Kampf that he learned a great deal from the British propaganda in World War I. Uh, they were about, the Nazis were about to attack Poland, okay? William Shirer of CBS News was over in Berlin. He was stationed there as a CBS newsman, and he kept a diary, the Berlin Diary, which he ended up having to smuggle out of Germany and had published a huge bestseller. And I want to read you uh, his entry for August 10th, 1939. How completely isolated a world the German people live in. A glance at the newspapers yesterday and today reminds you of it. Whereas all the rest of the world considers that the peace is about to be broken by Germany, that it is Germany that is threatening to attack Poland over Danzig, here in Germany, in the world the local newspapers create, the very reverse is being maintained. 
Not that it surprises me, but when you are away for a while, you forget. You've gone away and he came back. What the Nazi papers are proclaiming is this, that it is Poland which is disturbing the peace of Europe. Poland which is threatening Germany with armed invasion, and so forth. This is the Germany of last September when the steam was turned on Czechoslovakia. And if you go back and look at his entry for the year before, he's seen the same thing before the German uh, invasion of, uh, or seizure of Czechoslovakia. Now he quotes some headlines. Poland, look out, warns the Berliner Zeitung headline, adding, answer to Poland, the runner amok against peace and right in Europe. Or the headline in Der Führer, daily paper of Karlsruhe, which I bought on the train. Warsaw threatens bombardment of Danzig. Unbelievable agitation of the Polish arch madness. This is what he says. For perverse perversion of the truth, this is good. You ask, but the German people can't possibly believe these lies. Then you talk to them. So many do. Okay, I think there's a lesson in this for us uh, living here today to illustrate the uh, relevance of that harrowing anecdote uh, of, of life under Dr. Goebbels's press regime. I'm going to read you uh, from a piece that came out in the New York Times on June 2nd, 2016, a top aide to Assad takes serious case to a U.S. audience. This is a, not a front page piece but it was about a virtual appearance at the National Press Club in Washington by Butaina Shaban, a top advisor to President Bashar Assad of Syria, a country where the press is state controlled, and the Times makes much of this as it always has, a state controlled press, the state controlled press, the state controlled press. Now, um, it, you know, I, I assume that in, in uh, Damascus, where the press is state controlled, a high White House official could probably attend an anti-terrorism news conference, which is what this is, and talk to Syrian journalists uh, unmolested. But that wasn't the hearing that Dr. Shaban got at the National Press Club. Uh, quote, the Obama administration reacted with alarm to word of her nearby appearance via Skype with a State Department spokesman calling her a propaganda mouthpiece for Assad. Okay, so, so the piece sets up a kind of uh, a filter through which we read about the event and through which we understand this member of Assad's government. Now, uh, the piece points out that the event was tumultuous. Her brief speech followed by an extraordinary and at times contentious one-hour question and answer session with journalists and others, uh, at one point nearly devolving into chaos. You kill innocent people, a person who was not identified shouted as the room erupted in jeers and a moderator called for security. The person was not detained. So you can kind of picture the atmosphere here, right? Okay, now, the description of her, interesting. She bristled at questions about acts her government or close associates are suspected of committing, including the use of barrel bombs to kill civilians. I'm going to read that sentence again. She bristled at questions about acts her government or close associates are suspected of committing, including the use of barrel bombs to kill civilians. Now, I don't have to list for you examples of similar atrocity campaigns that we've read about in the Western press. From Aleppo, to various chemical gas attacks, uh, the crematorium, did you read about this in the Times recently? The huge, uh, it's like, you know, Buchenwald or Auschwitz, right in the middle of Damascus, burning up the bodies of all these Syrians. There are many of them. And you would not know, this is the important point, you would not know from reading the New York Times or any of its uh, affiliates in, in the US press or from watching CNN or MSNBC or listening to NPR, you wouldn't know, for example, that the barrel bombs meme was meticulously demolished uh, by Robert Perry of Consortium News. As indeed. Wait, wait a minute, sir. Are you denying the Assad regime? Hang on. Just a minute. Just wait, a minute. Are you denying the Assad regime has dropped barrel bombs on its people? Just a minute. 
He's talking about a specific instance of marijuana. I'm talking about No, I, I will answer you. I will answer you. No, I really would like to know. Stop. I'm going to do my best to report him. I'm not going to waste that. I'm sorry, but it's something like this. 300,000 people have been murdered by that regime. As far as 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 all right, and I have no, to say, no, no, uh, I'm going to continue by way of answering him because I have to say, I'm great. Yes, and I will. You'll stop talking. I will answer you. I'm grateful for your interruption because you have actually helped me to demonstrate my case. These stories infuriate people. Yeah. Exactly, they infuriate people by design. Now, whether or not, listen to me. Don't smirk. Don't shake your head. You, you can't listen. You can't listen to what I'm saying. But perhaps, perhaps, these stories are infuriating by design, okay? You say you get your news from the BBC. Well, the fact is that the BBC, PBS, NPR, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, they all get the same story from the same source. Repeat them, and the stories are infuriating. Now, I'm sure that even you will agree that if there is argument over the authenticity of that claim, it should be mentioned in a newspaper of record. Okay. The fact is that Robert Perry, who is a very reputable journalist, formerly at AP, uh, formerly at Newsweek, if he goes carefully through the claims made about barrel bombs and he demonstrates that they are dubious, then it seems to me it is incumbent on the New York Times, instead of just repeating the claim about barrel bombs as if it is a given, to give a hearing to those who have questioned it carefully. The same is true of the crematorium story, which you may have read, which probably also infuriated you, it got your heart pumping, it made you angry at anyone who dares to criticize or question it. But Rick Sterling, another investigative reporter, did the same thing with the story of the crematorium in Consortium News. He very carefully analyzed the Amnesty International report that, that revealed that or, or made that allegation, and he found that Amnesty International departed from its own extremely careful research protocols in coming up with that claim about the crematorium. They did not follow their own <coughs> rules for doing a thorough, careful, scholarly job of, of actually verifying those claims, which all seem to have come from interested parties. And if you read the New York Times article about the crematorium carefully, as a professor of philosophy I'm sure would do, you'll see that it is very thinly sourced, a lot of anonymous sources, some jihadist sources, and it is an extremely lurid piece full of references to the smell of burning hair and so on. But when you search the piece for some kind of solid evidence that bears it out, you can't find any, okay? You have to go back and read the Amnesty International report. Then you have to read the very careful critique of that report in order to come to an understanding of the fact that this thing you take for granted as just a given that Assad has murdered, slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people is at best a wild exaggeration. Now, having said that, I'm, I am departing from my script because of your stimulus, but I will say this, okay? He's shaking his head. He's disgusted with me. Hundreds of thousands of Right, you oh, just oh, keep oh, saying. Oh, right, oh, hundreds oh, of thousands oh, of people. Well, now this is, all right, no, no. He's not going to be able to take it. What do you want me to do? I can wait if you want. I'd love you to wait and be quiet and maybe ask a question. But this, yeah, that's what I'd love. But this, this, this is an intelligent man, okay? We, we like to tell ourselves that only the rednecks who voted for Donald Trump tend to fall for this stuff, that the rest of us are too smart. He's an intelligent guy, and he's by no means the only person who believes the stuff that's, that's pumped out nonstop by the entire liberal media, okay? 
that has an effect. If it's all you read, if it's all you know, and if you're inclined to believe it, then you will believe it. Then you will become angry, furious with anyone who, who argues with it, okay? That's simply a fact, and it's unfortunate because let's be clear about what we're discussing here, okay? We're talking here about war propaganda, professor. This is war propaganda. These claims... No, 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 stop. Because Listen to what I just said. This is war propaganda. This is war propaganda. What is the purpose of propaganda? Propaganda is not an intellectual exercise. Propaganda is a state instrument whose purpose is to bring about a particular policy, okay? In this case, it's to bring about a policy of war, all right? Just as all the stories about the invasion of Ukraine and the seizure of Crimea, which I have no doubt you also believe, the purpose of that propaganda is to bring on war with Russia. This is war propaganda. It is war propaganda. So that, okay, when you sign on and simply repeat it, and, and repeat it with vehemence and with conviction and with certainty without bothering to look into it, without being skeptical of the source, which in this case is the US government, okay, acting through the press, you are participating in a war propaganda drive. And I don't believe that you wanna see us, maybe you do, uh, declare a no-fly zone in Syria, run the risk of shooting down Russian planes and bringing us past the brink of a, of a nuclear exchange with a country that has a huge arsenal of nuclear weapons. That's what we're talking about here, that this is war propaganda, okay? Now, uh, you know, I, I, I think th this is not to say in any way that the Assad regime is benign or democratic, okay? Any, any, any more than to argue against the claim that Russia hacked the election is to say that Vladimir Putin is, is a peach, is your kindly uncle. That's not the point. I mean, we are not going to war with Saudi Arabia, which has an extremely uh, dangerous and violent government and violently represses its people. We're not going to war with Israel, whose human rights record is highly questionable. There's a lot of places with brutal governments we're not going to war with, okay? So the point to make here is that the way in which the US press, our free press, consistently uh, repeats exactly what it's told by the state and has those claims re-echoed endlessly across the spectrum of the press, okay? And then excludes, excludes uh, contrary evidence, excludes critiques of the official story. In doing that, okay, it actually creates a kind of unanimity or uniformity of opinion that's directly comparable to the way the Germans responded in Berlin, to the, everything they saw their newspapers say. I mean, not everybody has the time or the inclination to go around and read outside the boundaries of the official narrative. I mean, I'm a professor of media studies, so it's, a, it's my professional obligation to go and, and, and do this and teach my students how to do it, too. Don't simply believe what you read and hear just because the state said that it's true. And all these reports about Syria fall into that category. Yeah, let's not get uh, run down the same road we were run down in 2002-2003. Well, it's the same plan. That, that's actually, well, he's making a very good point, and then I'm going to, I should stop after this. I had, I had much else to say, but I, I again, I'm, Professor, I'm grateful for the, for the interruption, and I, I hope the audience is grateful for it, too, because it was a productive interruption. You know, Hitler said that the receptivity of the masses is limited and their intelligence is small, but their power of forgetting is enormous, okay? I don't often quote the, the Fuhrer, you know, it's not my favorite <laughs> author, but he knew what he was talking about. The people's power of forgetting is enormous. Now, we can't expect people to remember what happened in World War I. I mean, that to us is a comic memory from long ago when everybody moved real fast, you know. Uh, we can't expect people even to remember the Gulf of Tonkin re resolution that led to a, a, an enormous expansion of the war in Vietnam, and it was a, based on a lie, okay, that, that North Vietnamese gunboats had attacked American military forces. That was a lie. We can't expect people to remember something decades ago. We could, however, expect people 
thinking people at least to remember what happened in 2003 when we were told about the weapons of mass destruction and when let me add there was the biggest anti-war march in human history all over the planet unprecedented numbers of people turned out and marched against that war but maybe if, you know if we can't expect people to remember something that happened in 2003 we can expect them to remember something that happened in 2013 when we were suddenly told that there was a sarin gas attack on the Syrian people by Assad's government uh, Barack Obama hesitated to invade as he had promised he would if Assad crossed that red line and what happened Seymour Hersh revealed that that gas had been used by the rebels who had gotten it from the government of Turkey not a single US outlet would take that story by our most eminent investigative journalist he had to publish it in the London Review of Books okay about eight months later that story was confirmed in every detail by the leading daily paper in Turkey Zaman their investigative team looked into it and they said, it's true Hirsch is right Assad's government did not commit that atrocity it was the rebels it was what we call a false flag okay can we not remember that that's not that long ago but sure enough the gas attack or whatever it was in Idlib recently right just a few months ago people start screaming about this is just like 2013 you know even the journalists in the times are saying this is just like 2013 even though the times itself had dropped the claim they had a list of Assad's atrocities with the Idlib coverage and the 2013 attack was missing from the list so they had kind of retreated from that because it was a little bit embarrassing to them that Hirsch had shown it was bogus nevertheless for propaganda purposes it still served okay and the tragic thing about this aside from the indescribable tragedy for the Syrian people is that this time there is no huge outpouring of anti-war protest okay this is on the left the left has bought into this the white helmets you, you know the white helmets is, is a propaganda masterpiece that cost about a hundred million dollars <laughs> it has been it has been meticulously demolished by several journalists including Vanessa Beely who's written I think a dozen pieces on it John Pilger uh, recently did a terrific interview about the white helmets the white helmets is a jihadist enterprise okay these people are extremely dangerous and they're posing as uh, uh, you know good citizens in Syria saving the masses from Assad's brutal uh, uh, mistreatment okay well it's bad enough that the white helmets get mainstream coverage but they also get admiring discussion on democracy now the documentary is on Netflix and it got an Academy Award this documentary got an Academy Award and it is it is a fake from start to finish okay so what we're talking about now is is really kind of an advance on what we saw in Berlin in 1939 because now much of the left much of the liberal media Hollywood okay all these decidedly non Nazi entities are simply jumping in helping with the war propaganda when they should be exposing it and helping all the rest of us to resist it thank you